Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to High Water Women's Accelerating Impact Session. We are delighted to have you with us here today. Um, today is our second session. Um, last week, we held a, a panel discussion on ESG and public equities portfolios. And today we're holding a follow-up session to that to talk about um, measurement. Next slide, please, um, Valerie. Um, and models for implementation. Before we dive into that, I wanna just give you a quick overview of High Water Women and who we are. So High Water Women is a small 501c3 here in New York City. And our mission is centered around the economic empowerment of women and youth. And to do that, we have really three core programs. Um, we teach financial literacy and do financial empowerment mentoring um, in and around New York City and with partner organizations across the country. We have an annual backpack and holiday gift drive supporting single moms and their families. And the program that we're here within today is our Accelerating Impact Program. So it's really about building and strengthening the community around impact investing. And so we thank you for joining us here today. Next slide. Um, and under our Accelerating Impact Program, we have four key themes or areas of content where we hold conversations. It's just an organizing structure for us. We talk about climate change and climate justice, the impact investment portfolio, which is the work stream that we are in today, gender diversity and inclusion investing and place-based investing. Um, there are several ways that you can get involved with high water women. Um, you can become a member of our High Water Women Impact Network. Um, you can go to highwaterimpact.org slash membership. Um, and the membership fee is 150 annually, which underwrites the cost to, to do this work. And you'll get advance notice of upcoming events um, and be able to join other networking opportunities and stay in touch with us about current issues. You can volunteer to teach financial literacy or become a, a a mentor or join one of our program committees. Um, all of our work here at High Water Women is really driven through the volunteers that make it all happen. Um, and so we would love to, to have you with us. And we would also greatly appreciate any donation that you might offer to provide in support of our work. So those are some ways that you can get involved with High Water Women as an organization. Thank you. Um, I want to give you a heads up about an exciting event we have coming up on March 16th. Um, when we saw the Department of Labor statistic in December that 100% of the jobs lost in December were women, we were like, okay, we have to do something. So we are holding a call to action networking event with the amazing speakers that you see here on your screen. We're asking for a $150 donation to support women and small businesses. That's going to be um, a very exciting event, and we hope to, to see you there. I'll add links to the chat um, after so you can see how to get to this event as well as our membership. So back to our purposes for being here today. I am going to turn it over to Valerie to talk about what we're about today. Valerie. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, my name is Valerie Yun. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a member of the Young Women's Council as well as the uh, Impact Committee as well. And I will take us through the agenda for today. So today is going to be a packed agenda. The first portion will begin with an introduction from each panelist, um, coupled with a few questions to set the context. We will then open it up to the full panel for a broader discussion and then segue into the Q&A portion. Um, during the Q&A portion, we ask that those of, you, those of you who have questions, please turn your camera on and unmute so that you can ask your questions and don't be shy. Um, and then we will provide some key takeaways from the panelists and we will wrap up. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, you can use a Q&A box um, down below to post questions for the panelists at any time. Uh, we will also be posting some links in the chat box as well. Um, throughout the entire discussion. Um, and for the open session Q&A, um, you can certainly use a raise hand function um, or just uh, pop your question in the Q&A box and we will call on you then. 
Um, for any post programming questions or requests, um, please send them over to Alyssa. Um, her email is listed here and we will provide that in the chat box as well. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Sudar who will be moderating the discussion for today. Over to you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, firstly, I am just so delighted to be introducing this panel in particular. Um, we'll get a little bit into how the panel was constructed, but you actually have here in front of you four ESG practitioners who have been around and in the space way before it got cool in 2020. So I think for a lot of reasons, we are at a really special inflection point to be able to sit down with these practitioners, some of the first people in the space um, and truly get a little bit deeper here. We can turn to bios. This is my background. I'm more than happy to chat offline with anyone else, former investment banker. Um, I now do ESG and impact investment advisory and happy to chat offline with others. Betsy, to you. Great, thanks so much. Um, I definitely won't read my whole bio that's up here, um, but I uh, serve as sustainability and human rights counsel at Warwick, Harrington and Sutcliffe, which is a law firm. Um, and so I definitely approach ESG through the S lens, um, through the social lens. My background is in human rights, um, and actually, I came to the business and human rights space um, by virtue of working on international human rights law issues in international peace negotiation processes. So it's been um, a journey for me to get here. Um, I currently help lead our ESG initiative at the law firm with other great lawyers, including Gary Teacher and Ashley Walter um, and a number of others. Um, and so it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about ESG and um, it's something that, you know, we're getting turned to um, for advice uh, from clients more and more. Um, so I'm excited to talk about some of, some of the meaty issues um, that we're helping with. Hello. Uh Hello, everybody. Thank you for, for the, today's uh, invitation. My name is Andre Shanova, and uh, I'm a director of product management at uh, Refinitiv, uh, an LSEG business. So, um, yeah, I've been in the uh, ESG space uh, since 2009. Uh, I, I started uh, uh, work at a small uh, startup called Asset4 um, uh, back then, based in Zug, Switzerland. So, I uh, I quit my job in fixed income and uh, decided to uh, venture into this new exciting era, um, data space called ESG. And uh, pretty much since then, I've caught the ESG data bug. Uh, it's been a, a consistent line throughout my career. Um, Asset4 was acquired by Thomson Reuters uh, in late 2009. And, uh, and then of course, um, the uh, financial and risk business unit of Thomson Reuters became Refinitiv. And now we're, we're, uh, we've got our, our new home uh, within the London Stock Exchange Group. But throughout all of that, I've been focusing on ESG data, uh, supporting the investment community, um, either through analytics, capabilities, desktop tools, um, APIs, or um, whether it's coming up with new innovations. Um, so I, I designed the Refinitiv Diversity and Inclusion Index uh, back, uh, back in 2016, or uh, whether it's around ESG linked bonds. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I've, been, I've been swimming in ESG data for quite some time. So looking forward to sharing some insights. Hi everybody, my name is Kate Ahern and I'm the Managing Director for ESG and Sustainability at Cartica Management. Uh, Cartica is a woman-led asset manager that invests in public equities in emerging markets. Uh, we are an actively engaged investor that's focused on really how we can promote improvement in ESG practices, policies, and disclosures uh, that we think can build uh, value for our portfolio companies. 
So at Cartica, I work with our investment team to evaluate ESG risks and opportunities during diligence. Um, I help to develop an engagement strategy. And then if we do decide to invest in a company, I work to implement that engagement strategy during the ownership period. Uh, Cartica's not maybe not surprisingly because it's emerging markets, but we're often heavily focused on corporate governance. Um, but we're also increasingly focused on environmental and social issues that we think can, uh, you know, add to or detract from a company's value. Uh, before I was at Cartica, I was at Bain Capital, also doing ESG and impact investing. Um, and I'm glad to be here today. Good afternoon, everybody. Ryan Falscroft, uh, great to be with, with you today. Uh, partner with PwC based in our Boston office, and I lead up our uh, US ESG asset and wealth management practice. Um, so our, our work focuses on anything from strategy, policy creation, uh, diligence around ESG, all the way through implementing uh, the, the strategy um, during the whole period. And then ultimately focused as well on the data and ultimate attestation around some of the non-financial metrics um, that you may think about from an impact perspective, be it DNI, uh, carbon emissions, et cetera. So happy to uh, to speak about the the ecosystem today and the broad topic, and uh, looking forward to the uh, the interaction. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so I, the first thing that I want to call out to the audience is just how extraordinarily lucky we are to have a coterie of practitioners that have been in ESG for, in many cases, decades now. So these are not folk that got the memo that Black Lives Matter or that there is a problem with climate change, right? These are people who have spent their careers being change agents in small and large organizations helping to build this field. And in a lot of ways that actually informed the construction of this panel. The idea was to have a best in class corporate lawyer, someone who actually is front lines on the buy side, someone who is deeper in the data than anyone else. And then someone who can actually look at the entire market from the bird's eye view. And so we're very fortunate here at High Water Women to be practitioners in this space and actually have this conversation where we can get a little bit deeper than just what does ESG stand for? What is the difference between ESG and impact investing? And to be honest, I, I'd love to start just by making some observations on the market. I think we can all tell that ESG is blowing up by any metric, uh, whether it's volume, number of new products, heads of ESG at Wall Street firms or buy side investment firms. And maybe I'll turn my first subject of questions around data to, uh, to Andre. Um, when we were speaking in panel prep, we talked a little bit about the state of the ESG data market, right? And S&P bought IHS, Sustainalytics was acquired by Morningstar, uh, MSAI bought you know, carbon targets. So we're seeing so much incredible consolidation in a space that was really known for a very long time for fragmentation. You know, do you have some insights that you can share with us on how your clients use ratings versus metrics, maybe a little bit around where data is sufficient in places where it's not? Right. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to cover there. Uh, but um, look, I mean, we're, we're, what, some of the key observations, the, the trends that have happened in the last decade, there was obviously a big pivot towards uh, bulk uh, data feeds and the way our, our investment community are interrogating ESG data in ever more sophisticated ways where you know, we're seeing uh, the growth of uh, the Python uh, user uh, is, 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 is really, it's, it's grown phenomenally. Uh, whereas I remember in 2009, uh, it was uh, about having a desktop and then, you know, building your own custom ratings, combining, uh, you know, various factors, weighting them, and then maybe exporting into Excel or do some, doing something like that. Um, so I would just say that the, 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 the level of sophistication and uh, really verging on like data science territory uh, has, has, has been a massive increase there. The, the, the rating story is an interesting one, of course. Uh, they've served a, 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 and they continue to serve a purpose, but I think as uh, the investment community want to measure impact, 
you know, it's very hard to measure impact with a rating. You know, there's so many factors that are, you know, being uh, condensed into one score. So we're seeing increased, uh, you know, more granularization of, of ESG data. And we're going to see an acceleration of that because of, for example, um, we'll probably talk about this later, uh, you know, EU taxonomy or other regulations where it's, it's not just about organization uh, level information, but it's, uh, it's about looking at business units. Where are they located? You know, how do you overlay that with macro uh, economic information to, to try and derive what's the impact of the operations of, the, of a particular site? Um, so, and we're also seeing the move towards uh, spatial finance data, right? Uh, there's there's, there's a, a, a lot more interest in that. And, uh, and maybe that will have a, a, a purpose to serve when we, we talk about uh, biodiversity indicators, for example. So there's, there's, there's an explosion, there's a, a huge amount of, of ESG data, and I haven't even touched on like project financing and the whole sustainable finance world colliding with uh, sustainable investing, but it is, uh, you know, like 85% of our users are, are, are looking at uh, some, some kind of ESG information. So that's huge. Uh, in 2009, I, I was trying to, to preach people to try and, uh, you know, look at ESG data because it's, it's genuinely, there's something there to look at. And we were all trying to say, hey, look at this because it could potentially even generate alpha or maybe it's a good mm -hmm. beta strategy. You know, it was really, um, you know, pretty hard times, actually. And, uh, well, you know, in, in the space of 11 years, how, how quickly that's changed. I, I completely agree. You're seeing, you're seeing all the panelists just like nodding. Yes, we've been preaching this. Yes, we're sort of in a new era now because of this black swan um, pandemic and it breaking, it's breaking open fissures that we all knew existed around social inequality and climate injustice. Um, I mean, Ryan, turning to you, it's pretty clear when you, and we can talk about private markets separately, but when you look, just look at the, the choppiness and the volatility of the public capital markets, even aside from GameStop and Robinhood, right? We saw investors trying to find alpha really from thinking about positive and negative externalities. That feels like a ready-made introduction to ESG. So what are you seeing in terms of your clients and your partners thinking about real-time data? Is there going to be more pressure to get better quality data from sources like Refinitiv on a daily basis? I mean, how exactly are you seeing this affecting your part of the ecosystem? No, great, great point. I think the, the real-time data is, is where folks are aspiring to be I think stepping back and, and thinking about just what are some of the motivating factors around the data, it, it's really three or four items I, I'd point to. One, investors. You know, I, I think it's response to your various constituents, and, and obviously investors play a large role in, in organizations responding. And that can be in the form of the you know, fundraising, DDQs, requests for information, et cetera, that come through um, the various organizations. The second is, is storytelling. And, and by that, I mean, how do you as a firm take the data and your story around ESG and how do you translate that back to, to your various constituents in the marketplace in a fight for AUM? And how, how are you authentic in that? And how importantly do you underpin that with data to, to really validate that? And then I think the, the third motivating factor is, is tying it to performance. You know, so as you're thinking about impact, as you're thinking about some of the metrics that we'll talk about today, how do you draw that correlation to performance of, of the underlying fund, of the underlying portfolio, et cetera, from that standpoint? And, you know, as, as we, we mentioned, it's data underpins all of that. You know, real-time data, I think, would be, would be nice. I'm, I'm not sure the market's there yet. I'm not sure firms are ready, you know, managers to, uh, to have that amount of data. Uh, I've, I've had some clients say it's not necessarily the quantity, it's the quality of data that mm -hmm. I really need to yeah. focus on right now and, and really narrow in on what that correct data is to, to help me tell that story. And, and the other thing I think organizations that I see and work with are focused on is investor-grade data. 
-hmm. So I think, you know, from a financial statement side, everybody feels comfortable, it's investor grade, there's a people process technology that goes into how it's produced. I think that is still maturing on what I'll call the non-financial data side, you know, which ESG would be a part of in terms of thinking about existing systems, existing processes, existing controls, and how can you really integrate that ESG data into something that you're already comfortable with to have the output be investor grade data from that standpoint and really then use that to, to help you in the marketplace and, and tell that story. Yeah, you're, you're teeing me up perfectly because I want to turn to Kate at Kartika in a moment. And um, just by, by way of context, Kate actually comes from Bain Capital, where she was the head of ESG, which I think might have actually been one of the first organizations in private equity to have that role. So when I think about what you're saying, Ryan, around investor grade level data, it is worth noting that there are not that many organizations that actually treat ESG as if as if it is a source for real alpha generation, right? A lot of ESG heads sit under a legal counsel or the chief risk officer, or maybe under investor relations to, to brush off those pesky Scandinavian LPs. But Bain and now Partica are really organizations where ESG is embedded in the organization. Kate, I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about the very active approach that Partica uses towards investor grade level ESG? It's not just uh, the starting point of your strategy, it's really the, the secret sauce, right? Well, it's kind of funny, you know, when I was at Bain Capital, I was more focused on the private markets than the public. And so when I came to Kartika about a year and a half ago, you know, I was so excited as an ESG person to be, to say, you know, oh my gosh, I'm going to have so much access to data. I'm going to know everything I need to know about every company that we might invest in, right? You know, because it's public equities which is you know, really different uh, from the private side. And, and maybe we'll get into you know, this, this question of whether there will start to be data and ratings for, you know, for private companies as well. But um, not surprisingly, maybe, and I you know, should have thought of this, you know, there's so much less data available um, you know, from the definitives of the world, from MSCI, Sustainalytics, even Bloomberg um, for emerging market companies, um, you know, especially those that aren't, you know, mega caps that everybody is invested in and which we don't invest in. Um, and so right now, you know, we use Bloomberg, right. You know, like everybody else, we use, uh, MSCI primarily as a, a jumping off point during diligence when there's ESG data and analysis available. Um, I would say maybe half the companies that we look at have an MSCI ESG rating and report, for example, right? So sometimes we're, we're going in purely uh, using our own research, um, you know, on, on what we can find publicly, what we can, um, what, you know, when we interview a company, we talk to the management before we invest, we, you know, we get an idea from them there. Um, but, you know, really for us, because we're an, an active manager, um, because we think ESG improvement can create value for a company, we don't really use you know, ratings and data as a gating mechanism. You know, there's there's not a score um, below which we won't we won't invest, right? You know, though we do a lot of diligence on, you know, integrity of management, integrity of controlling shareholders, et cetera. But there's not sort of a floor, partly because that would really just knock out you know half the companies in emerging markets that we might want to look at from a data perspective. Um, so we're really focused on whether there are areas that we see as potential value creators um, that maybe others have missed because there's so little, you know, easy data out there, right? Investor quality data out there. Uh, we take a long time to dig in and, you know, try to understand where a company might improve. Um, you know, we're thinking about can we convince a company to improve its capital allocation? Uh, can we convince the company to add more qualified, independent, diverse members to its board? Uh, can we alert the company to a water issue or other climate related risk in its supply chain we think it should address? Um, and I would say, so sort of coming back to this data issue, we are really focused on working with our portfolio companies to make sure you know, that they get credit when they are implementing best practices or when they do put in place uh, a new policy that reduces a risk, right? We, we mm -hmm. want them mm -hmm. to improve their disclosures so that, you know, Refinitiv and, and MSCI and others can improve their outputs to the market, right? And we hope that over time, the market will 
revalue a company, you know, recognizing that maybe a bit of um, reduced business risk or new sustainable product lines, et cetera. And so that, that's actually quite a big focus of our work is improving that output of data for the portfolio companies that we're invested in. Yeah, no, and that's that's a really critical point. Uh, just for the audience, I want a, a level set on context um, and just thinking about the, the public equity space for now um, that Kate and Ryan have spoken to. I would think about this space as a spectrum between passive and active investing. You have your, you know, passive managers over here, maybe they take Refinitiv or maybe they take MSCI or, or one sort of data source. They Possibly they do some negative screening here. There are some guys in the middle that are getting a little bit more active, more deliberate, the atlases of the world, right? That can maybe have a long short strategy. But then now you're getting into the active space and Kate's team is like way at the other, <laughs> way at the other end. They're at the tip of the spear because yeah. you're working. You are working in frontier markets with small and medium sized corporates, right? So when you're talking about active corporate shareholder engagement, that is a different level of engagement. And I hear in this maybe uh, an opportunity to turn back to Andre before we dive into the S. Andre, take yourself off me because I hear in Kate's voice an enthusiasm to work with ESG partners like Refinitiv to go deeper on investor quality data in the emerging markets for small and mid cap. How do, how do, what is that surface for you? Yeah, and just before I, I, I dive into the, the, the small mid cap emerging market piece, I think we have um, for a long time been treating ESG data like fundamental data, like financial fundamental data. So I really try to um, cleanse and standardize the information, but not, you know, trying to fill in the gaps with, S, you know, black box estimate models but really trying to extract as, as the companies have reported, but then standardizing it into really useful metrics. So um, I just wanted to mention that because that's really important to us uh, that we, we treat ESG data like fundamental content. As for uh, uh, disclosures um, and, and capturing more data on uh, emerging markets, emerging markets from experience is pretty patchy because it, from what I've seen from experience, it, it does depend a lot on the, the regulatory environments uh, that we're talking about. So if you're looking at South African companies, they actually have really good ESG uh, disclosure levels. Um, and in Brazil, you know, you could have really good social uh, data disclosure levels. It, it, it really, um, it, it kind of depends on the, the geographic location. And then also it depends on the stock exchange listings. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a number of exchanges over the years have uh, adopted this comply or explain approach. And that has done wonders as well for, for ESG uh, levels of, of disclosure. Um, on, the on the private company side, we, at Refinitiv, we are actually uh, looking at expanding ESG data coverage for about a thousand private companies. Um, and that, that's the first time uh, we're gonna be go doing that. Uh, historically, it's always been uh, equities, and we're also expanding into small uh, small caps uh, as well. But we have to be pretty um, targeted about where we do that because, again, uh, you know, we, we're looking at mainly like Europe, the European continent uh, for, for for small caps. Um, because, yeah, it is, you know, it's uh, you know, if you take a thing like. Uh, I don't know, total CO2 emissions, you know, for about, we have about 10, just over 10,000 publicly listed companies in the database. For that one metric, you're probably looking at 55, 60% uh, disclosure, right? And that's probably the most uh, frequently looked at, uh, one of the most frequently looked at measures is carbon, like for, for climate. Mm -hmm. So it does vary from obviously from country to country, from exchange to exchange, from sector to sector. Uh, but um, we're, we're definitely, we're going into that space. Uh, but I would say 10 years ago, uh, you know, it would have been you know, very, very hard to do. Um, so, uh, but now I think it's, it, is, it is a possibility. That's exciting, everyone keep in touch with Andre and, and help him push for more data in, in privates and in emerging markets and for small and mid cap. Um, I, I wanna park CO2 emissions and, and other GHG emissions for a moment and maybe dive into the S of, of ESG. 
And Betsy, your career in China has been particularly interesting. There's no question that China is not a frontier market anymore. We're not talking about the wild, wild west where there are no regulatory disclosures. But we are talking about a market where human rights are complex and you've had some experience with that. Can you share a little bit about some of the work that you've done in China? Yes, absolutely. Um, and first, I realized I didn't explain what I do <laughs> or what, what how lawyers fit into ESG. So let me back up and do that. Um, so, um, so basically, you know, we help companies identify risks and opportunities in the E, the S, and the G. Um, substantively, what that looks like, we help companies with a range of ESG related policies, whether that's a human rights policy, one of my areas of expertise, um, broader ESG and sustainability policies, supplier codes of conduct, um, conflict minerals policies, the list goes on and on. Um, and then uh, help companies to implement um, governance processes um, designed to help kind of, you know, enforce those uh, policies. And then, of course, understanding the increased um, regulatory and legal landscape surrounding ESG. So um, now I'll park that for a second. Now that I've done that, um, because my area of focus, we have folks who focus on the environmental, folks who focus on the governance, but mine really is um, the social piece of it. And one of the areas that um, I've been watching for years, um, but has really accelerated over the last couple of years is what's happening in the Western part of China in Xinjiang. And I think it might help here um, to provide kind of a hypothetical, um, potentially based upon um, a, a true um, client story. So let's say um, you, uh, let's take a software development um, company that creates facial recognition technology products. Um, you, um, you run the risk of potentially having, if you're selling to entities in China, having those facial recognition technologies used in Xinjiang province in Western China, where there are there's rampant use of forced Uyghur labor. Um, and I won't get too much into the details. I'm sure everyone has read um, the kind of what's happening right now um, in Xinjiang, but um, essentially the government has forced um, Uyghurs into, concent into a, a new version of concentration camps, um, re-education camps. Um, and so, so let's say, Facial recognition technology company. You, if you're selling to someone in China, that's a risk that you face. If you are also developing a hardware product as part of that technology, you also risk in your supply chain that um, components for that hardware were sourced from Xinjiang. Um, and so that's just kind of one example, um, but I'm seeing it come up now in buy and sell um, agreements in renewable energy. Um, I'm, it's, there's been, most of the focus has been on tech and, um, and retail because cotton and hardware products, but um, I'm starting to see it pop up more and more in other industries. Um, and moving beyond China, you know, it, it, there are, um, you know, a number of areas where, you know, if we're looking at the hardware component, um, lithium ion batteries in our, in our phones and all of our devices and the laptop you're using now um, use cobalt. 70% of cobalt is sourced from the DRC. What happens in the DRC? Well, there tends to be child labor, forced labor. Um, and so you, you want to know kind of what procedures are being in place in order to, um, to avoid um, that sort of thing happening as much as possible. It, and it doesn't just need to be kind of emerging markets where, um, where human rights standards might be different. Um, so facial recognition technology, what's, what, what's used in that? Typically it relies on some level of machine learning, um, artificial intelligence. Um, I'm sure everyone on the call is familiar <laughs> with kind of the bias that can 
um, happen when um, that sort of technology is being developed. Unintentional bias, right? Because we are humans developing technology um, and depending on what the sample um, size is um, and the sample being used, um, it has the potential to, um, to perpetrate biases. So, um, and, and that could be sold anywhere. Um, it, it got quite a bit of press during the Black Lives Matter movement because it was being used by law enforcement officials. Um, should law enforcement officials be using this technology and a number of companies um, stopped producing it. So um, I, I mentioned these by way of, these are the sorts of risks that I am looking at um, when I'm working with companies. Um, and it's not to say, you know, it, and it, it's about what are the policies from my end, what are the policies and processes that you are um, putting in place as a company in order to try to mitigate um, those risks that exist exist in the world. Super interesting. And um, I think at the tail end of that explanation of your body of work at Auric, I, it's also a really good opportunity to say Auric is sponsoring this and they're doing that from a place of seeing what the future of ESG looks like. They're making an investment into being a leader in this space for, for decades and decades to come when Andre will be a very old ESG data provider and we all have gray hair. Um, but I hear what you're saying, not just around hardware, right? In mark from markets like China, which has obviously gotten a lot of press, but the technology side is something that we don't discuss as much in emerging markets. I live in the Bay area where every private equity company now has a head of ESG, pretty much none of venture capital funds do because technology is the great leveler because technology is neutral in design and up and lifts all boats, helps the poor as much as it helps the wealthy, of course. Um, I mean, Kate, turning to you, you've worked in some of these markets as well. Um, I know at least a few that Betsy's mentioned are active markets for Kartika. Anything that you can share from your portfolio, technology or otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I'd say we, we take the same general approach as, as um, Betsy mentioned. You know, we are focused on, you know, what practices are in place that a, that a company is um, implementing that we think can help reduce risks or, you know, create opportunities uh, what are the policies that, you know, help to communicate those practices, you know, mostly internally, right? You know, does everybody within the company know that they're supposed to be following a part, you know, a particular practice? And then, of course, like I said earlier, we're also focused on disclosures. You know, are you telling the market what we need to know, you know, to understand the level of risk that we're assuming? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think the... And, I would say I think regulations are getting tighter, uh, and I'm and I will I'm speaking mostly to emerging markets here. You know, regulations are getting tighter almost everywhere. You know, on environmental standards, on labor requirements, on safety, um, and I think part, partly we're seeing a bit of a trickle down in many companies and, and many countries. You know, from large, you know, mostly U.S. and Europe-based customers who are tightening rules for their suppliers. Right, so um, certainly not perfect, right? For, but for us, you know, sometimes going on limited information about say um, a Taiwanese manufacturer's health and safety practices or its policy on conflict minerals. Um, you know, we feel better when we know that, you know, Apple is responsible for 20% of that manufacturer's revenue, right? You know, it's, it's almost a proxy, right? We, we know that Apple is likely auditing that company um, so, you know, the company standards are, are likely okay, you know, if, if not best in class, right? And so for us, a lot of times in, in tech space and in, in others, you know, we're, we're almost using that um, large buyer um, practice as, as a proxy for what we assume is best practice of, that the company is implementing. Um, and something interesting, I think, to me is that we're also seeing emerging market consumers increasingly pushing on companies to improve their practices. Uh, there was a social media company in China uh, about, a lot, about a month ago that big, you know, sort of the YouTube of China um, published a video that was misogynistic, um, just generally really creepy. And there was an uproar from users, right? You know, who said, this is creepy. And that translated into a number of Chinese brands saying, you know, we're no longer going to advertise on this platform. Um, that caused the company quickly to take down the video, 
to apologize, to commit to better content controls, right? You know, so I think this, um, I'm, what, what, one thing we're watching is this sort of consumer activism, you know, and, and how will that be a tailwind to better ESG practices for companies in, in emerging markets? Um, you know, so, and we're also seeing a lot of retail investors who are starting to put their money where their mouth is, you know, as sort of sustainability and ESG consciousness is growing among consumers everywhere. Um, we're seeing retail investors in emerging markets who are investing in their own countries, um, you know, to, to start to put pressure on companies as well, which means that companies are, um, you know, tech and others are becoming uh, more sort of consumer facing, even if they're B2B, you know, they're launching Instagram accounts, they're adding to information on their websites, they're blogging, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're really sort of becoming more um, publicly facing as opposed to sort of B2B customer facing. So. Uh, I think that's just something sort of interesting, um, interesting to watch. Um, interesting, Betsy, what, what you're, if you're seeing that as well. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I wanted to turn Ryan, but Betsy, you got to respond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, yes, I am seeing that as well. And I, I wanted to pick up on one thing that you said, which is the increased regulatory environment around this. Um, just going back to China, um, over the last, um, it's been about a year now, a little over a year, we have seen, seen increased regulations, um, withhold release orders at the border, meaning that um, imports can't um, come from certain um, manufacturers. Um, and um, before the Senate right now is the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, um, which would be, if it passed in its current form, um, although there are definitely still negotiations going on about the text of the act, but if it passed in its current form, it would um, basically create a presumption that anything imported from Xinjiang, China, um, was the result of forced labor and therefore be banned unless the company showed by clear and convincing evidence that it was not. Um, <laughs> I, that is a very high standard that has not um, been applied to any other um, human rights issue that I can think about. Um, so it's, um, it, it's definitely one to watch for this given um, the amount of supply chains that touch China. And I actually saw that exact language replicated in a, um, in a, a buyer agreement, um, basically requiring a representation requiring that nothing came from, um, was, was no, no supplies came from Xinjiang, China um, and replicating the current language um, of that draft. So um, that's, it. you know, looking at the regulatory environment um, on that particular issue, that's one to watch out for. Yeah, the plan originally was to turn to active versus passive management, but I'm getting the sense that this coterie, and I'm imagining the audience as well, we're excited about active management. We're excited about approaches like Kartika's where there's real engagement, not only with corporates, but sometimes even with the regulators. So I kind of want to stick with this regulatory theme a bit more. Andre, you've actually been studying um, nights and weekends, I'm sure, all of the new legislature that's coming out in Europe. Um, before I turn to you, I just want to provide a little bit of context and then and focus you. We, we saw the EU come out with an FRD. We've seen in the last four years of the Trump administration, the SEC not really push FASB. With the new administration, like what are you projecting is going to happen in the EU? Is the UK going to continue to lead the charge here? How do you see the United States maybe catching up or fingers crossed playing a little leapfrog? Mm, okay. Well, I can certainly talk to the uh, EU piece. Uh, I, I, have, I have been in the weeds of uh, everything EU taxonomy and SFDR, Sustainable Finance Disclosures Re Regulation, and the required technical standards, and within that, the principal adverse impact indicators. Um, so it's, 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 it's seismic. I mean, it's a really big deal. Uh, the, the EU regulation will, will have um, impacts beyond uh, just Europe. Um, 
it's already kind of setting the standards and you can see in China actually they're coming up with their taxonomy which is actually fairly closely aligned to the European one um, and there are other national taxonomies that are, I'm, I'm sure are, are being devised to also protect kind of their economies too but it's it, it's really fascinating so our first thing to mention with uh, EU regulations it's all still in in flight so nothing's kind of really been solidified yet but it is inching closer, and uh, and and so you know whether it's uh, the latest uh, RTS, so level two, these principal impact uh, adverse impact indicators that investors will need to start reporting on. There's about 18 indicators in there, and they're very quite they're very detailed, right? They're looking at emissions. And, and also um, looking at sovereigns as well. So it's not just about corporates. Uh, also, if you've got real estate assets, understanding what's the uh, energy performance certificate ratings of those assets, it's, it's going to um, create a huge amount of data disclosure uh, from, from uh, corporates, a huge amount. SFDR will be a, a driver, but equally the EU taxonomy which is a slightly is a different animal, but they do they do support one another. So there, it's more about understanding what percentage of a company's revenues are substantially contributing to one of the six objectives of the EU taxonomy. So so far, objectives one around climate change mitigation and adaptation have been uh, pretty well fleshed out, and it's already publicly available. Within those, there are technical screening criteria. So depending on where your company's activities lie in terms of uh, economic activity, there are benchmarks, thresholds that need to be met in order to be considered aligned with this European taxonomy. That in itself is also going to generate more detailed ESG data. And when I say de detailed, it's really, really detailed. Uh, it really, uh, uh, you know, we're we're doing our best to, to capture that, but it's 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 going to be uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that that develops and we you know um, whether it's about cement emissions uh, per ton of cement produced or looking at steel production uh, per ton of steel produced in it as an emissions figure they they're, they're really really going at it and 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 in a very thorough way uh, so uh, yeah I'll definitely say that that's that's I'm pretty excited for it but it's also a, a big big challenge but um, I think we're we're getting ready for it that's exciting um, and when I when I hear what you're saying and I, I think a little bit about what this might mean for the future my best guess is that the the benefit that uh, best in class ESG active manager has as a leader in the space may actually shrink over time as regulation makes every corporate better around disclosure. It actually reduces the ability for a Kartika, let's say, you know, 10, 20, 30 years to actually have that alpha generation because of ESG um, proprietary analysis. And what that makes me wonder is what's going to happen to the passive guys, right? And so Ryan, I'm turning it back to you as, as, as we planned but a little bit off schedule, what's going on in the passive ESG space, right? I, I imagine that most of the clients that approach you are active, right? Because they already have a very clear strategy, but there's also this incredible amount of growth happening just around passive uh, one tilt funds. What's their secret sauce? And is it really sustainable from an outsider's perspective? It sometimes looks a little bit like ESG washing. What do you think? Yeah. No, and, and, and maybe just, uh, Andre, I'll, I'll give two cents on the U.S. landscape um, from, from that standpoint. Briefly, I think if we had this discussion a year from now, it would be a completely different discussion around regulation in terms of the U.S. landscape. You're seeing, you know, the, the focus um, from, from regulators, you're seeing reminders about rules that have been on the books since 2010 you know, around climate change, et cetera. Um, so again, just the, the noise and the conversation topic is, is certainly resonating. And you're seeing a lot of focus across the administration, not just from one agency, but across the administration wide, which again, I think, you know, play it out 12 months from now. And this would be a, a great discussion to sort of see the, the movement 
and perhaps is there more you know level footing between different territories or or uniformity which when I talk with clients, one one frustration is just the continued, you know, operational challenge of functioning in different territories with different regulations and different frameworks, et cetera, uh, which is challenging. On on the passive side, there's there's a discussion ongoing and, and one that that I, I have with clients around. It's an interesting setup in that there's a regulated product being a, a passive fund. Uh, that quite often is built upon or relying very heavily on uh, information that is perhaps unregulated in, in the same manner that a, that a fund would be. And what I'm seeing in, in that space is more increased conversations just around the manager trying to educate themselves more around, Andre, you mentioned that the black box earlier, you know, getting more visibility around the data sets and what is that, you know, foundation of the data and what does it mean and how to interpret, et cetera. So I think on the passive side, you're really seeing firms try to move away from just pulling a data set and using that as the baseline and moving forward without much analysis and really trying to dive a layer or two deeper to engage with the data providers and have those, those conversations so that they in turn can have those uh, conversations with their investors and, and also draw out some of the synergies and benefits uh, from that information a bit more wholesome. Uh, and to your point, make it be um, a bit more challenging and, and in commercially, you know, along with the active, you know, who has perhaps better, better access, visibility, et cetera, you know, from that standpoint. So what I'm hearing is that the best in class passive ESG managers, they, they do have one source of data, but they use that as the starting point for either layering on additional data sources or possibly proprietary research. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, I think, I think it'd be, you know, there's certainly products that are based on one source. There's products based on a, I'll say, weighting or average of multiple sources, or to, to your last point, some organizations that say, look, we're just going to take the underlying more raw data versus maybe the scoring and come up with the proprietary in-house point of view, which again gives them, you know, perhaps going back to that storytelling, the ability to, to tell that story in terms of how they're interpreting and thinking about the data uh, from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. I, Andre, I have to ask, how are you seeing passive clients using your data. I'm really still thinking about Kate's comment a moment ago of how 20% of um, uh, suppliers uh, work actually going to Apple and her using that as a proxy for a certain quality of supply chain. That's possible in, in her part of the, the public capital markets, but in the passive space, right, where you don't necessarily have as much of an ability to really dive deep because of management fees and just the, the structure of those funds. What are the best in class passive managers able to do with Refinitiv either on the metrics, either on the rating side or getting deeper into the metrics? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a combination of both, right? It's, it's uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, very smart kind of uh, algorithms that combine not just ESG scores, but really look at um, different thematics, look at those thematics from an ESG lens, combine them with financial uh, metrics to, to derive some sort of calculation and then come up with an index of sorts that they, they, they'll, they'll focus on. So it's, 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 it's all the above. And it's a little bit of secret source, really, because yeah. it's the competitive advantage as to how you do that. Um, so I, you know, maybe uh, the more sophisticated ones, I, I really wouldn't be surprised if, if they do become a bit more like black boxes, frankly, because they, they, they do get so sophisticated, uh, like there's these smart beta strategies and so forth, you know, they, they, they are really um, sophisticated is the best way to describe it. And, and increasingly, they use more real time uh, type ESG data sources. So I'm not talking in the corporate disclosure sense, but in the news and what's in the public domain, social media, mm -hmm, so there's a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, AI technology used today to capture sentiment and the direction of that sentiment in through different ESG lenses. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, we, 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 we do a bit of that as well um, with um, 
news controversies, for example. But um, there are many other uh, players out there as well who, who, who focus on that, and uh, I'm sure they 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 uh, they include some of that into their their uh, analytics. Um, so yeah, I that's that's the best way I could describe it for you. But it's it's hard it is hard to know what how, how some of those passive uh, investments are, 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 are calculated. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, it really does make one wonder though if George Seraphim at Harvard gets his way and FASB begins to push gap to do something like impact weighted accounts. And now all of a sudden every corporation is forced by the SEC to actually have positive and negative externalities baked into every line item of their income statement and balance sheet. Where is Kate gonna find her alpha, right? Um, but I, that's still in the US, not, not in emerging markets. Um, I mean, I, I wanna turn Back to you, Betsy, put you a little bit on the spot um, on two fronts. One, um, we hear from Ryan that this will be a good conversation for us all to regroup on a year from now. So hopefully we can hit up you and Oric uh, for more sponsorship 12 months from now. But you're, you're a lawyer, you are obviously embedded in the regulation here. Can you build on what Ryan and Andre have said about your hopes for what the Biden administration could do around EU? Regulation. What if you could actually draw out the future? What would you draw for us? Sure. Well, why don't I start with where I think it's likely going? Because um, I actually am hopeful and excited about where I think it's going. Um, so we um, have our eyes like set on the SEC and what the SEC is doing. We were all very excited to see an ESG advisor appointed um, to the ES to the SEC um, for the first time um, in that kind of level of a role. Um, and um, you know, were you hear statements um, from? I mean, we've been hearing them from President Biden even during his campaign about how important climate is. Um, to his agenda, and we're now hearing the SEC discussing climate-related risk disclosure requirements. Um, we had the human capital management disclosure requirements at the end of last year. Um, NASDAQ, um, you know, recommended um, board diversity requirements, um, disclosure requirements. So I, we are already starting to see a shift. Um, as Ryan mentioned, there's a lot of regulation already out there, right? Um, that fall when you're looking specifically into the E and the S and the G, um, and actually we're undertaking, um, you, you know, lawyers, you kind of operate in your lane for so long, and now clients are demanding for us to look at these at ESG holistically. We're actually undertaking an initiative to kind of put all of that together, right? All of these pieces we've been advising on in our own little lanes for so long. How, what, what exists already um, and where are those gaps that we could expect um, new regulation to be, to be filling? So that's, um, you know, that's kind of where I think it's headed and I'm hopeful for where it's headed. Um, I, you know, are we going to... Um, meet, Europe is almost always ahead <laughs> on these issues, certainly on the environmental um, and social pieces of it. I, I don't know if we're going to go that far um, here in the U.S. Um, it would be great to have, you know, speaking of kind of different coalescing around different frameworks um, that Ryan mentioned, I, I think, I, and I'd be curious how the panel, other panelists feel, but I feel like I've seen now coalescing around SASB, PCFD, GRI, SDGs, like those are the ones that I'm now kind of seeing the most. The most. So does, um, does the government need to go one step further and require a certain framework to be, you know? So I, I don't, um, I don't know. I'd be curious though um, what others think, but I am hopeful um, in terms of a focus on, um, on these issues by a Biden administration um, and kind of where, where my, that might take us. I, I think that we would all echo that sentiment. Um, 
we're at time. So I just wanted to do one quick closing round, Robin. I think Betsy, you've kind of teed us up perfectly with a, a trend, a sort of growth trajectory that you're excited about. Maybe I'll ask everyone else to sort of build on that. Um, what is one trend in ESG that really has you feeling great about our ability to only hit 2% by 2050 or our ability to address social inequality? Um, and I will, I'll start. Um, I'm actually really excited by the amount of results-based financing that large corporates and private equity companies are tying to around ESG. I was really delighted to see uh, Megan Starr at Carlisle help push out the first diversity, equity, inclusion linked bond offering where the cost of capital actually goes down if that private equities portfolio companies do a better job of elevating people from different backgrounds and gender orientations to positions of leadership. That builds on a big trend that we've seen in the leveraged loan and in the fixed income market around sustainability linkage, right? I think if you get a, an ESG rating of certain you know, number and above from Refinitiv or MSCI, your cost of capital at Bridgestone actually drops, right? So it's cheaper debt. Um, Ryan, Andre, Kate, maybe I'll, I'll turn to each of you guys in turn. Ryan, what, is, what are you excited about? What gives you hope? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll build on that, the, the various commitments that you see in the marketplace. Um, one, one trend that we are seeing, and, and obviously if you think about the role that PwC has played in the financial reporting markets historically is the third party attestation, you know, for firms like, like PwC and, and others that can provide that outside in third party validation around metrics, non-financial metrics, such as DNI, such as carbon emissions, or even more broadly, such as the application of some of the policies that we've talked about today. And I think in, a, in an environment where being authentic around your story and what you're doing as an organization, as we move into the future, that third party uh, validation aspect will be, will be important. And we're seeing organizations that are, to your point, trying to continue to be leaders and, and are leaders in the space, leaning in on that front to, again, provide differentiation from those who perhaps are not as mature uh, in the topic, you know, than those that have been, been in the space for years. Andre, you want to build on that or go in a different direction? I, I might go a different direction, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, I, look, I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm spoiled for choice. I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> You're that optimistic about ESG's future. I, Great. No, I, am, I have been Top five. For 11 years, I've been optimistic, so... Uh, no, no, I, I, no, I really am. Uh, look, um, I'm, uh, I'm working within the, uh, this, this task force for nature-based financial uh, disclosures. So it's kind of um, it's, uh, it's modeled uh, loosely on TCFD, but what I'm getting at is uh, I'm also excited about the, the next frontier in ESG data when it comes to biodiversity and understanding biodiversity impact of uh, man-made assets on, on the environment. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of really interesting technology which looks at how the potential impact of nature on man-made assets, but it's not really the other way around. Uh, so, from, you know, from an insurance perspective, for example, if you wanted to know what's the risk of this pipeline being impacted by a, an earthquake or something like that, there's, there's been a lot of development in that space, but it hasn't been the other way around. So. I, I, I'm, I'm excited about that because I think it's needed. Um, there's obviously, rightly so, there's been a lot of flow, focus on climate, but I think biodiversity uh, deserves uh, and should be uh, of, of greater uh, importance and focus. And then second one, of course, I can't help it, but of course, EU regulation, the EU taxonomy is so massive, uh, you can't, can't not ignore it. And, uh, and I am excited for it because it, because of the increased uh, transparency disclosures that we're going to have. And, and it's going to open up, um, I'm sure, lots of other questions and, and opportunities. So th those are the two areas I'm, I'm excited about. Kate, maybe you can finish us off here. Uh, sure. Uh, just a small addition to, to what you said, Sudar, about um, financing. We, we invest, we are um, invested in a company that this year uh, secured a sustainability linked loan 
that specifically if they hit their targets, which we think they will, uh, we'll save it $2 million a year over, you know, the non-sustainability linked loan. And so what's also kind of nice about this, the, the financing is that you can show people very specifically, you know, if, if you can pay attention to ESG, somebody values that, right? And you can save money, right? Or someone will pay you, right? And, and so I think a lot of times in, in ESG, there's some, a little bit of a struggle to explain exactly how a particular action, you know, translates into value for a company. And I think with the sustainability link loans, it's sort of a really, it's a nice, easy um, package, right? So here's, here's the specific example. Um, but then the other thing I would say is just the, you know, there was no way we were going to really address climate change unless the US and China decided to participate. <laughs> and, you know, I think in the last six months, right, there's been a lot of great news on that front, right? You know, China's commitment to go carbon neutral by 2050, US commitment to rejoin Paris, right? You know, I, I think that, um, you know, hopefully the regulatory environment in both places, you know, in addition to, you know, a number of other places that have committed to improve um, will really put the wind at our back on, on the environmental side and, and will, you know, help all of us who are trying to convince companies, um, you know, either through their operations or through their products and services to, to be more um, environmentally friendly. I think, you know, that will, that will help enormously. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Perfect. Last thought to, to close on before we turn to Q&A. So thank you. Um, I'm going to read this next one from Moya Connell. Um, and I am not sure who this is directed to. So it's, it's, we'll find out by the end. An earlier speaker spoke to ESG as a focus on the development of policies and procedures for companies. Many companies had developed this, but the implementation is still a black box. Can you speak a little to the questions of action slash performance? How important are those? How those are tracked and rated? And are companies even reporting on this? Does anybody want to rise to the challenge of speaking to the complexities of actually implementing ESG? I, I can speak a little bit. Kate, were you going to say something too? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if this is in follow-up to um, something I said. So I, um, I would generally say sustainability reports as they currently exist usually don't go into the nitty gritty of how things are done. So I agree. When you look at most sustainability reports, you, you're not able to see what is, what is actually being done on the back end. Um, for the larger kind of more established companies, I, if you want to kind of see what's being done, I think kind of the, if you break up the ESG issues into chunks, you know, like a lot of companies produce, um, you know, supply chain or supplier reports, right? And, and for those, it's increasingly common for companies to, and, and not across the board, but some companies are transparent about, you know, these are our um, first tier suppliers, these are our second tier suppliers, and they'll actually break down how it is that they audit suppliers and um, how often they do it and what risk issues have come up. Um, so amongst kind of the big public companies, I do think you can start to get into um, the weeds on what is actually being done um, based upon kind of what, what is out there. But um, I agree with Moya um, completely from the standpoint of, you know, it's act what's actually happening on the back end um, that's, that's most important. Yeah, and that's why we need guys like, um, like Ryan at PwC to actually do these attestations. Um, we just got a, a, an update from our organizers that folk can unmute themselves in a moment. Um, but before that, I had one question for Ryan. Um, I think a lot of us were really excited to see the big four accounting firms really come to a landmark agreement at, uh, at Davos at the last World Economic Forum to really step into this kind of missing space of attestation. Uh, we've seen UNPRI kind of take a run at this, IFC operating principles for impact management take a run at this. Um, but really until these four accounting firms have clubbed up to do this and arguably Tideline's blue mark was created with this mission purpose in mind, there really wasn't anyone actually saying, hey, we'll be the ESG cops. Um, can you share a little bit about this new product, this new function that you and your team are going to be overseeing. And, and also, 
um, if it's not too controversial, how are you managing any perceived conflict of interest there? So I think I think reference to the, the World Economic Forum metrics that the, the big four firms uh, pr produced in, in conjunction with, with the World Economic Forum. And I think there it's just to, to level set, because when, when we have discussions with clients, it's really pulling from the best of what's out there. So, so that was the intent of the, the WEF metrics was not necessarily creating a new framework to further muddy you know, the already crowded landscape uh, in alphabet soup, but looking towards SASB, looking towards GRI, looking towards TCFD and trying to create a set of core 21 metrics and then enhanced metrics if you wanted to, to be an A plus student, so to speak, to have corporates report on from that standpoint and try to get some apples to apples comparison for the investor community from that standpoint. So I, I think that that is one where, um, you know, a, a great process in terms of each of the four firms taking one of the four pillars and then looking through what was there currently and coming up with uh, best in class, you know, for, for each of the pillars. And then to your point about ultimately uh, being involved with as organizations and corporates adopt, uh, disclose and report on metrics, be it WEF or be it others, SASB, TCFD, GRI, et cetera, being a, a part of the capital markets in terms of that third party validation from that standpoint. And then to, to your point about, you know, just perceived, you know, conflict of interest, et cetera, that does fall under somewhat to just a financial audit uh, independence you know, requirement. So, so again, uh, the firms could not you know, create, calculate those metrics for a company and then come in and, and provide that attestation. There is that independence and separation uh, from that standpoint to, again, give the, the capital markets um, you know, that, that visibility and confidence and, and the ultimate reporting should a company you know, choose to go down that path. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. I remember um, back in my investment banking days, always being a little curious how the rating agencies, S&P and Moody's, how they would work very carefully with clients who were paying them for their initiating ratings reports. Um, but I think it's a really important space that you and the team are stepping into. And I'm very excited to, to start reading about some of the work you're doing there. Um, I think that hopefully now audience members can unmute themselves, which is exciting get into this conversation. So anybody wants to be the daring first audience question? It's funny, cause I actually met Kate for the first time at a, a dinner party um, at a mutual friend's house. And it feels like the five of us are at an intimate dinner party with an audience of anonymous invisible <laughs> watchers. Um, oh, Joanne Benner, please. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, well, okay, so I'm starting my video. Um, so thanks very much. Um, it was a great presentation. It sometimes becomes, you know, we're practitioners. So we're looking for tools to do to do things. And we're looking for tools that allocators can use. So a sort of a dashboard view of, of how are you doing? How are you doing against and, and and sometimes it is liquid investment, sometimes it's illiquid, sometimes it's so-called impact, sometimes it's CSG. Um, there's a tremendous amount of talk and additional discussion. I was on a discussion earlier today about this and someone asked the question, how do you do attribution for ESG managers? Like, how do you even think about that? Um, because, because ESG is, is is, is it's the biggest allocation we have in our portfolios, right? Equity allocations tend to be the largest public equities, liquid equities. How do you, how do you even start looking at that with, from a framework perspective so that we know that there can be progress down the road as data becomes more available and we have wonderful heat map reporting and on any dimension you wanna look at, but you know, take something like, uh, I don't know, diversity. How do you actually, report that across all of your strategies in, in, an, in, a, in a way that a, an investment committee can understand. I'm gonna direct this to Andre because I feel like you're in the best position to give a, a bird's eye view on this and also speak across asset classes if it's helpful. Oh, wow, well, yeah, I mean, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I don't know. 
I don't honestly don't know if I have the answer. Um, but I mean, well, I don't know. From experience, um, I've worked. I, you know, I, I designed the diversity and inclusion index back in 2016, and so we we looked at obviously we've got the data on percentage of women on board, of course, but women in executive roles, women in middle management, new women employees, women employees targets around diversity and opportunity, controversies. So we looked at a range of, uh, of factors, not just around gender, but we, we tried to look, look at other criteria. But anyway, if we were to focus on gender, um, well, since we have the metrics, we can aggregate the data, roll it up, right? It depends on, on the portfolio and the equities that you have. Uh, but it, it, I mean, you could derive some sort of median or some, Percentage, average percentage of women in board roles uh, at a portfolio level, we could easily do that. But I don't think that's getting to the crux of what you're after, really. And and so yeah, look, I'm just being honest. I I I I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't really know how how you could have that dashboard on on those different ass, asset uh, managers and how they're managing it on on a specific factor and how that gets rolled up into some sort of um heat map of, of sorts but it's it's a, it's a great suggestion and something that you know we can i can have a brainstorm about with some colleagues of mine seeing how we can do that tell your agile team to to get cracking kate i saw you unmute yourself do you want to yeah, take yeah, it i'm just curious Jan. I, I thought you were going a different uh I'm not, I'm, maybe i'm not sure if i understood your question when you say attribution do you mean does it matter that ESG investors are invested in a particular company, you know, or do you mean, do our ESG managers do better over, you know, a set of um, metrics that we care about than our non ESG managers? Yes, I, 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 both. Right. So I think it's both. So I think uh, one part was how, how do you compare your portfolio against something else? And you can look at it relative to a benchmark. But I think what we're trying to get at is the economic value of incorporating these factors. So it's it's not just knowing that I invest with this group of companies, but that this performance is actually, that, that my performance in some way is attributed to that. I will tell you that in the pre, in this it, other discussion, they said uh, that you couldn't, you couldn't look at alpha right now. Like alpha was not in the, in the formula. Um, and, and I, and I think that that's really, important to to start to figure out, even as a baby step, right, as a step forward to say, first, let's figure out what we've got relative to something that's meaningful for us, for our investment committees. And then let's try to look at the, the value of, of, this, of this addition, right? All this additional work, what's the value of all this additional work? And maybe there, maybe it's not the right question. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't be asking that question. <laughs> maybe, Again, maybe it's more of an impact question. I, I, again, I'm struggling a little bit with just trying to put it into a little bit of a framework so that we can, we can, we can be coherent. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because when I think about um, really the additionality of ESG and the public capital markets, it is just so difficult and diffuse. But I completely agree with your sentiment that once you can actually identify that impact alpha and you can value it, I mean, the, the goal would be to put every ESG investor out of business by virtue of everyone thinking about investing with this lens, right? I mean, that's, we'll have to regroup in 10 years um, under Oryx's sponsorship, um, not one year. Um, but actually, I, I wanna build a little bit on what you and Andre were saying. I agree that measuring the number of women on boards and, and gender diversity through very tangible metrics like that is valuable, but just turning to a deeper, more active approach, wanted to elevate the work of Rachel Ribichotti and her partner, Maya Philipson, who said, yes, that's a start. Absolutely, it is important to know what the gender breakdown is in leadership. But they actually went a step farther and said, we're actually going to work with the largest corporates who actually have mandatory, um, they have mandatory forced arbitration, which is a really easy way to push women out after they've been sexually harassed in a firm and they said, look, you know, more than just knowing that we need to have women on boards, let's actually talk to activists in gender equity and figure out what are the tangible steps that we as an activist shareholder can take to push organizations like that um, 
any other any other examples either on gender or on going deeper than just the metrics that other panelists want to build on here? Yeah, I'll maybe mention two two thoughts just from from how I'm thinking about it. One, I'd pay attention to the endowment industry right now because the the endowment community has come out with a focus around DNI for managers and saying that that will become a uh, lever in terms of allocation of dollars and and there's there's discussion around to to the question well we need to have some consistency and some baseline in terms of the expectation before you know everybody can sort of think about it that way so that's one thing I, I would keep an eye on the other if you're dealing with public managers I think uh, Betsy, you mentioned earlier the human capital disclosures that went into effect this year. I tell clients, look, you know, as 10Ks are getting filed for public managers, that's a great data source to just see what is the disclosure around human capital. Do they have anything around diversity and inclusion, gender, et cetera, and use that as some, some education material to go engage and have further conversations with them. The, the last point in terms of how do you link it to, you know, something more than just the, the, the metric. Um, starting to have conversations with uh, more along private equity around how do they think about some of the, for example, carbon reduction. You know, so if you think about your port codes and you go through and you plot out over a whole period what's a carbon reduction, at the at the exit point, tie that back to performance and say, look, here was a company that had you know flatline. Here was a company that actually saw a twenty percent reduction, or here was a company that had five percent growth. And how do you then tie that back into more of the financial performance and look for that correlation and value creation upon exit to then tell the story into the marketplace or as you're thinking about fundraising in the next round and pull it more from just a metric to that performance and value. Yeah, both really interesting examples. Ami, can you so help just, us close here? Yeah. Uh, I got one more question and then we can close and then I'll hand it back over to the team Please. to close. But I um, so Ryan, you opened a little window and, you know, and building on Drianne's like tools and the overall objective that we at High Water, High Water Women want to impart with our, with our members is this, you're sitting, you have an advisor who's telling you that they're going to help you find investments that have an ESG alignment. How do you know what they're telling you? Like what, what are some snippets of information or questions that you should be asking to ensure that you're actually asking the right questions and you're getting answers that are sufficient at least or that they're knowledgeable or that they're not just giving you lip service. And I think maybe it's one or two sort of sharper questions to ask or the tougher questions to ask if you're sitting in the seat in front of an advisor. So, so I, I would say there, there's certain things in today's environment that are just table stakes, having a policy, being able to, to talk about the topic, et cetera, when you're, when you're out in the marketplace, fundraising and the like, or doing diligence you know, with, with folks that hire you. I think the, the one piece of advice I would give the audience is to ask the question, show me. So show me an example of where you've applied your policy and how you documented that decision. Show me how you've used you know, the data that Andre provides and you've thought about it analytically to get to a you know, investment decision making. You know, show me how you've thought about you know, these different metrics and the value that they've created and really you know, push and inquire around the underlying artifacts. Because I think that's gonna be where you'll be able to get you know, more than just a gut feeling There'll, there'll be you know, more of a sense as to this is an organization that has thought about it, has developed an approach, you know, has the ability to articulate specific examples uh, as Kate's gone through today, you know, and really gives you that comfort to say, yes, this is somebody that, that takes the topic seriously and is authentic you know, from that perspective. And I'm going to take the moderator's privilege to actually turn that brilliant question back to you. I mean, you're, you're a GP in the emerging markets. What are the toughest questions that you get from LPs or potential partners? We don't get enough tough questions from LPs and potential partners, which is why I'm posing the question, because I think it's still, first, many LP shops are still figuring out how to do better diligence 
on GPs and how to actually distinguish um, a well-performing GP that has both an impact and a financial mandate or an ESG and a financial mandate. And, you know, it's been years trying to figure out how to assess good valuation policies. I think this is no different. Valuation policies, as everybody at the table knows, is an art. It's not a science. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there's some that there's a lot of components within ESG that is not an art. It is actually very structured, uh, intentional, and 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 can be diligence properly. And I and that's why I asked the question. It's I I challenge the LP community to be more thorough around this topic and take it as seriously as they want us GPs to. Yeah. Yeah. I I really love that, and I I really appreciate that Kate's nodding nodding (laughs) because. Here are two GPs who are not afraid of the question, right? And just to um, highlight that, you know, I imagine that some of your LPs are just, you know, trying to make sure that they have allocation in the next fund. Maybe that's not, maybe that's why they're not pushing for harder questions, um, looking at the performance of early LFR funds. Maybe they just don't want to be squeaky. Um, mm-hmm. So I know that we are very close to time, and I'm glad that we were able to do closing round robins on a positive note and get some audience questions. We also have a whole slate of exciting new programming for the month of March that maybe the High Water Women would like to cover now. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank um, all of our panelists today and to our expert uh, moderation today with Sudar. Thank you so much. Um, And thank the members uh, in the audience from our impact committee. Um, as well as everyone who's attended today. And, and thanks again to Oric for your leadership and underwriting this work and American Century Investments underwrote our previous session on, on this same topic. So I hope you got value from today uh, and some takeaways. And I wanna just remind you of our event coming up on March 16th, um, a call to action, women in crisis, women for impact, Women Helping Women, part of the solution. Come hear our um, amazing opening speaker, Melissa Bradley, co-founder of Eureka. And then we'll have breakout sessions, which are really small networking rooms um, led by very senior people talking about current issues and what we can do to address um, some of the challenges that we see happening today. Um, We would love to have you participate with with High Water Women in any way that that you're interested. Um, Here are a few ways you can get involved. You can become a member um, of High Water Impact. So join this network of people with engaging in active conversations. You can volunteer um, in this program or our financial literacy program. And of course, we always welcome and appreciate any donations that, that you may make to support this work. And with that, I want to thank everyone again for your time today and, and go forth and be strong and continue to do this, this important work. So have a wonderful day.